Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea DeHaan, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and so thrilled to have you joining us today. I'm also joined by co-host Dr. Shannon Peterson of the Institute for Government and Politics at Utah State University. And I'm going to tell you a bit about our guest, but before I do, I want to remind you as participants how you can participate today. So we know that this is on Zoom and not in person, but we would still like to hear from you. So please use the chat to give us a friendly hello or to communicate any technical issues with me as the host. But also note that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen if you notice that Q&A button, that will give you the opportunity to ask questions of our guest as we continue the conversation today. And again, we'd like you to be part of that conversation. So please do populate that as ideas come to you and we will make time to get to those questions at the end. Let me start by telling you a bit about today's alum. Today, we're joined by Brogan Ovina Milan, and he earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Utah State University in 2005. Originally from Spain, Brogan has been living in London since 2006. He currently works as a customer success manager at Ernix, a company devoted to using statistical modeling, big data tools, and machine learning to help the insurance industry. His professional life started at Bloomberg and he has remained in the tech sector ever since. Brogan enjoys the social aspects of his role as well as the opportunity to learn from different clients and colleagues. Solving problems is his bread and butter and what regularly brings its satisfaction to his daily work routine. And even after 14 years, Brogan still enjoys discovering London's beautiful parks, amazing food, sporting events, and mostly the many opportunities to socialize with people from all manner of backgrounds. And Brogan, we are thrilled to have you joining us today from the UK, um, and we welcome you. And I will turn the time over to you and Shannon to tell us a little bit about your experience of living abroad, as well as your experience of finding your way into the tech sector as a humanities major. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, yeah. oh, go ahead, Brogan. I thought I think most students are going to be interested in how someone who um, majored in political science ended up, first of all, in UK, but also you know ended up at some place like Bloomberg. So, I so mean yeah, no, absolutely. Um, um, so first of all, uh, it, my, uh, my uh, I'm not sure that my past self uh, would like uh, me to be. Giving them any, giving him any, any lectures or recommendations, but I would definitely would have um, appreciated these kind of initiatives back in the days. Um, so I, I, th I think it's a great idea, and I've had quite some contact with USU over the years, not just with the humanities college, but with other parts of your university for very similar conversations like this one. So I really and truly hope that um, you all can get something out of this. So how did I end up in the UK? Well. I think that that studying and travel, uh, studying and um, working overseas or um, in a different country to, to your country of origin, it's it's a uh, it's based on on necessity, but mostly it's based on uh, attitude and, and and wanting to do it. Uh, way before I even went to Utah to do actually my master's degree, not my bachelor's, the the. I have been studying in the UK already, so that that was always kind of like natural to me. I always that I always like that kind of challenge. And when I finished my 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 time at, at USU and I went back to Spain, where I'm originally from, and I started looking for a job, and this is the first advice, if anything, if if I can call it like that, the first advice is move over whatever there's a market. Um, always play the numbers, right? Like they say in gambling. Uh, I was trying to make my way through the labor market yeah, in Spain, trying to you know, send in applications and all that. And I was getting nowhere. And uh, one day just having a simple conversation with my dad, I told him that I've, I, I had the impression that, I had the impression that um, um, if I could, in every single application that I sent, if I could add a local telephone number as well as a local address, I would have a lot more opportunities. and. I spent 12 months in Spain, exactly 12 months looking for a job. And I only made it to the semifinals in a couple of opportunities, not even to the last round. However, when I went to London, I and I had my mobile number there and I had an address that I borrowed from a friend of mine, it wasn't even my address. Uh, I got a job in less than a month. Um, so play the numbers, look, look, decide what you like and you don't have to be extremely specific and look for the place. 
where what you like is more abundant and move that. So the fact that it might be in a different country is not a problem, should not be a problem. I moved there when I was 26, if that helps in any way. My, and, 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 and the longer that I spent in, in, in London, I thought, geez, oh my, oh, I wish I could have been here when I was 21. Uh, so play the numbers, play those odds and go where you think there's a market for you. And this silly thing about the resume or the application with a phone number and all that, all that means is that, yeah, uh, application processes are an absolute pain in the neck and uh, they seem extremely unfair from, from outside. But there are ways that you can learn to, to, to play tricks because eventually most companies will hire for um, attitude and they will train for a skill. And that's the first thing you have to bear in mind. You, 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 you didn't, uh, you didn't choose your major based on becoming a um, specific, um, um, and a specific uh, uh, becoming a tool. And a tool for me would be like from a heart surgeon to an architect, right? Yeah, they, they go to school and they get to be that. I think that your advantage is that you can be a lot more things. There are way more options for you. The disadvantage, if anything, is the effort that you have to make to select your own options or to decide which options are the best for you. But there are options out there. Uh, the, uh, you're on mute, Shannon, sorry. Sorry, I was sorry. gonna say, how did you decide, um, once you moved to London, how did you decide to, uh, did you, what type of jobs were you applying for? Um, what yes. made you decide to apply to tech and how did, you know, how did so you end up there? It, it goes back to, it goes back to uh, playing the numbers, right? So uh, when I was, when I was initially applying for jobs, uh, for jobs after, after my time at uh, Utah State, um, most of the applications went to, um, like the development sector, international organizations, and so on and so forth. Uh, where I was living in Spain at that time, my home, my parents' place, um, it's a small place, there's nothing else there. Uh, so all I had in my mind was what was in my mind. I know it sounds silly, but this is what I know. And the place where I live is not teaching me anything else because that's where I, live, where, I, where, I, where I was born and I grew up. I know everything there. It offers me X. And that I learned a long time ago. Whatever else I learned at school, uh, that's what I had in my head and that's what I was applying for. So when I moved to London, trying to play the numbers game, right? At the same time, what happened is that you realize, wait, hold on a second. Uh, the world is a bit bigger than I thought in the sense of uh, there are so many opportunities here. Why would you choose technology? Why wouldn't you? It's, it's interesting. It's curiosity. It's... it's, it's <laughs> It's, a, it's been hand in hand with, with humanity development through history, right? So the reason why I chose technology is because of the cross, uh, um, how would I say this? Uh, the cross pollinization between technology in this case in the financial markets and economics. And that's why I ended up at Bloomberg. Um, it allows you to uh, face the challenges of the financial markets, extremely linked to politics and economics, but at the same time, it allowed me as well to, to um, grow on a business acumen in terms of how do big companies work? Uh, how are the dynamics internally? Uh, how, what kind of role these structures and uh, of, of, of management, middle management, senior management, et cetera, work? Uh, how do you relate? And that's what I, what Andrea referred to in my introduction, the sociability aspects of my role when I'm talking to clients because I'm talking to clients because we're selling them a service, something that is going to help them in the day to day. And that's the technology. So that's that's why it happened. Uh, you, the simple fact that you go somewhere means that you're gonna bump into opportunities that you didn't know that were there, or you didn't know, or you weren't one hundred percent sure that would be suitable for you. But that's a preconception. That's a prejudgment. Is it doesn't have a lot of value. Okay. So what sort of challenges did you face when you first started? Um your career uh, in the tech sector there? Oh, so <laughs> the first one was to kind of like catch up with main financial concepts, which I had no idea about. Uh, 
but this has no science. You grab a book, you grab a manual, you read it, and you learn. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is good. So I go to university and I and, and I want to become an, an architect and I and I study architecture and they're gonna tailor me to be an architect. I think that the advantage of humanities and social sciences. And I hope it doesn't sound silly because sometimes it does in my mind, but I'm saying it with, with all my conviction. What these degrees teach us, they teach us to think. And I know it sounds, most of the days we just move by instinct and habit, but these, these, these degrees, whether it is politics or philosophy, sociology, et cetera, et cetera, history, they teach us to think and to think critically. So the moment that you find yourself in an environment like that one, where you have to learn something new, all of a sudden you realize that you learn quicker than, than most people. Um, it's a lot easier to, you would be surprised how in these days I might be talking to a, a computer science or a data scientist or something like that. And it's so hard for me to make him explain things that to me sound extremely simple and vice versa. So we've got that skill as well. We've got that ability and that ability allow me to, you know, overcome the challenge of not knowing enough about financial markets and financial market dynamics, the name of products, how they, uh, what purpose do they serve, how, are, how they are originated. And then when it comes to technology, you know what? I always think of it as a video game. Uh, any technological product is, is, is just a box for which you have to learn these instructions, right? So that was learning the Bloomberg product, the Bloomberg tool, the Bloomberg uh, services that we sold to clients. Um, again, it sounds extremely simple, but just, Try that on, and uh, there are things that you know better than most, and you try to explain it to people that you can see them. You know for a fact they're extremely smart, and they might be really good in their own uh, fields of knowledge, and they're gonna have a hard time understanding it because we've got that advantage. And, I, and, and that was the challenge, and Shannon, when you asked me, and uh, I think that the fact that I come from the background where, where I come from helped me a lot. Okay. So what would you say to say, um, and we've, you mentioned it already, but I, I think for a lot of liberal arts majors, when they think about the tech sector, they don't, they don't think it's immediately for them. Um, they might recognize that they have, as you mentioned, the ability to learn. Uh, but what other skill sets do you think that they might have that not, they might not recognize that are applicable to this area um, and can really help them find a position or find something that really works for them? Um, so let's go for what's interesting um, uh, or, or about technology in itself in that, that particular sector and how that may appeal, if I understood your question correctly, to, to, to our audience today. Is that? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so anyone with, a, I don't know, humanities, liberal arts, background, right? They, they, they're going to realize, and, and we were talking about it beforehand, they're going to realize that if you move into the technology world, right, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it might be a bit daunting, it might be a bit challenging, yes, of course, and because we all think about all of these uh, people who are working there, uh, uh, building stuff of, of, of having the kind of knowledge that we don't have. And yeah, you don't have the same knowledge as ours, as us. It's a different type of knowledge. And the first challenge is going to be learning their language. And by learning their language, I'm not talking about programming language, or I'm not talking about Russian, if these computer engineers come from Russia, or Chinese, if, or uh, Mandarin, if they're coming from China, etc. I'm talking about uh, understanding what it is that they want to achieve. And you're going to realize, if you like challenges, there's your reason. But at the same time, you're going to realize that you become an integral part of, of, of that project. And I think that that's an attractive thing. What do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that all of these companies, they, let's say that they have a great idea. Any, any of the latest, uh, I don't know, are working very niche for large markets, but for very niche products. But um, anyone thinking about what Uber is nowadays, wouldn't be able to sell it and explain it to the rest of the world if you didn't have people with the ability to understand those concepts, isolate those concepts as the most critical part of what they're building and put them together into a narrative and then being able to know and identify where that narrative is going to fit out there in the market. And that's us. You're gonna realize that your brain is done for that because there are a number of economic processes out there that you studied at school 
that work in the same manner. There are a number of historical processes that you studied in history that work in the same manner, isolating concepts, building a narrative, and see how the narrative fits with reality. Uh, philosophy, that's basically it. So you're gonna realize that there's uh, satisfaction in applying your skills. And these skills come from the degrees that you're studying. I've got absolutely no doubt. Some of you guys are going to be a lot more talented than others. <laughs> and perhaps you carry a little bit of type of skills that everybody loves and all that, and it'll be easier. But all in all, we've, we've all learned it. I learned it, and I'm sure that you're learning it right now. I've got absolutely no doubt. And that, to me, is interesting. Now, why technology? Why not? I mean, just look at it. So it's, it's, it, we are drunk with news about technology on a daily basis. It's... It is literally the next big revolution in terms of, in the same way that the steam machine or, 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 or telecommunications last year, et cetera. Why wouldn't you want to jump on that? You know, uh, uh, who didn't want to work for Ford at the beginning of the 20th century, right? And, and, and there was not a single school where they taught you how to work in a com, com, uh, conveyor, in a conveyor, right, to build a car. Well, this is the same nowadays. There's no school that teaches this stuff. But some people are prepared for that. And I think that we are intellectually and mentally prepared for it. Thank you. I think that's really important. Um, your One of the articles that you, and we should mention that there are a number of articles that Brogan has shared with everybody if you guys haven't uh, already read them um, about the tech sector, the tech sector in the UK, um, how your degree might apply to this, this area. Um, but I wondered a little bit if you could talk about um, the tech sector in the UK. Let's talk a little bit about the UK in particular. I think a lot of people are interested in potentially working in Europe um, and maybe you know how that sector is changing, um, yeah. some of the challenges in that sector that they might be uh, might promote opportunities for students who were interested in pot potentially, you know, moving to London or yeah, the UK. Yeah. It's um, <clears throat> so it's a competitive sector, but then again, finding a job is not something that happens just like that, right? So we shouldn't be concerned about the fact that it's it might be challenging or difficult because I'm sorry, but that's inevitable. That's a unless your mommy and your daddy aren't who they are or something like that <laughs> for the rest of us, it's inevitable to, to uh, that, that we're gonna have to really uh, make an effort and, and, and persevere, right? So that's the first thing. Yes, the UK tech sector, which is basically, well, it depends on the kind of technology you're talking about, right? The kind of technology I'm talking about where people from liberal arts and humanities play a big role is this new high tech, um, uh, startup applications, etc. These type of technology. The, the UK has a, an extensive uh, 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 technology sector, but there's a stuff about electronics and uh, avionics and stuff like that that doesn't apply to us, right? So the, the the kind of technology sector I'm talking about is based in London. Other places in Europe where these uh, silicon roundabouts and silicon streets uh, exist, besides London, there's a burgeoning one in Lisbon, in Portugal as well. There's another one in, 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 in Berlin and probably missing a few more because definitely you, you can find the same thing in some of the Nordic countries. Um, so that's those are the places in, the, in, uh, in Europe and uh, the, one of the articles that I, that I shared is basically um, it gives you access to, to, to the jobs, it gives you access to the companies, it gives you access to statistics in this particular market to make sure that your efforts are laser focused. Um, there's nothing more to say about this particular website, but it's very easy to interpret. Just go there. It's it's it's, it's helpful for anyone who wants to who wants to start with this. Um, now, if you move to a place like uh, like London to look for a job, why London? London is attracting um, London is attracting these kind of uh, or has been attracting these kind of. Uh, um, it, this type of industry and it continues to attract it because it's London. Uh, so the way I look at it is that at a very early stage, uh, this kind of technology is always very close to uh, political centers because a lot of these technologies somehow comes from heavy, heavy subsidized by the government uh, investigation and research, right? But as it, as it evolved, eventually, and as it becomes independent from, 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 from a web and a network of publicly funded research, 
What they're looking for is a place where they can attract talent, where people are going to be happy. I don't know if you've been there to London or to other places, but I can tell you that Lisbon, London, and Berlin are awesome places. <laughs> they're fantastic cities. They're beautiful. Lisbon, on top of all that, is very mild weather compared to London and Berlin. But all in all, they are beautiful places, vibrant and great. And they want to be in those places to attract talent. Because people are yeah, looking for a future, for a future, for a career. They're looking for a salary. They're looking for that. But they're looking for a life as well. So they need to attract talent to places where talent is comfortable and where they want to live. So that's basically the, the map and the, and, the, and the landscape in London. Now, what sort of technology are we talking about here? Anything and everything. It's not to the point of obviously Silicon Valley and all that, right? But it's definitely from the point of view of FinTech, from the point of view of um, multiple consumer applications or even applications for other technologies, it's, 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 there's, there's so much, there's so much. And um, for an entry level job is great. I was telling Shannon and Andrea before I joined that, that I had a good career and a good stint at a very mature and, um, and uh, um, very successful company like Bloomberg. And I took a risk going into, the, into this um, other side of the technology uh, sector. And I took a risk going into uh, young companies that are experiencing growing pains. If you are 21 out of a school of 22, there's no such thing as this kind of risk. And uh, it's, I, it'd be great. It's, it's just, I'm gonna tell you the typical stupid things of uh, good looking uh, offices and stuff like that. Yeah, but at the same time is accelerated exposure. And, and, and accelerated um, knowledge, uh, learning, sorry, accelerated learning. It's, it's, it, it, that's what you can find here in London. It just depends on which pillar of the industry sector you wanna look at. The, the most, um, the most uh, um, settled or experienced ones or, or the older ones in terms of everything related to finance or a lot new things related to networking and uh, consumer products. Or the consumer sector. Thank you, Brave Brogan. Sorry, I keep saying Brogan, but um, I wondered, uh, given your experience, you've you lived in the United States, you moved and took a risk going to to London. Um, what would you tell students uh, who we ha we have a lot of students that are interested in? living overseas and working overseas that are sometimes you know it's a scary it's a little daunting a scary prospect to to travel a pick up move to some place they've never been before you know they may not have a lot of connections or no connections you know yeah. what type of advice could you give a student um that might uh, be interested in doing something like that well I, I i i tell them to put things into perspective and uh the first time that you leave home when you're 17 or 18 to go to university is quite daunting as well and here you are a few years later. So uh, I'm sorry if this is going to sound self-deprecating, but if I did it, anyone can. <laughs> so it's it's really not that big deal. And I want to, and my God, I don't want to sound like, like, like an old grandpa or anything like that because I don't consider myself that, I'm still quite young. But when I moved into London, when I moved to London and I was 25, not six, as I said earlier, and he was, May 2006. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it was daunting, right? And I was kind of like, um, not under pressure, but thinking like, if I don't do that, I will never do it. And I didn't like that thought. But what I want you to bear in mind is that there was nothing, uh, uh, like no iPhones, no internet in our pockets, no WhatsApp, uh, no Facebook groups, no Instagram, whatever. Uh, the ability to find keen minds and personalities it's a lot easier these days and you can plan and pre-plan for that in a much easier manner than i could back in those days because i didn't have the ability to contact people like that if i wanted to send a text message they would take a lot of money out of my out of my pocket and that's just a text message um so Yes, it's daunting, it's challenging. I don't think it's going to be any more daunting and challenging than things that you've done before. If you give yourself some credit, you'll see that you've taken those steps in the past. 
But most importantly, uh, even if it's something in challenging, you've got tools at your disposal that you know how to use better than any, anybody else out there to soften things up. Okay, thank you. How would you, what type of advice would you uh, give students who maybe don't understand the concept of networking or taking advantage of maybe the links and networks that they might not know about um, when um, they are venturing out in something like this? Uh, well, the first, uh, the first advice is, 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 is never too, too early to start networking. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's never too, it's never uh, an, um, an uncomfortable time to, or it's never a bad time to pay attention to what other people are doing and see if you find inspiration there. I didn't do anything that no one did before. I just follow on the steps of people I listen to and people I talk to and people I respected and just follow the same steps, right? Um, so what kind of advice? It's never too early to start networking. Uh, now you know somebody and that's me, at least that's one person and I'm sure that you know more. Uh, but again, networking is a lot easier these days because the way I see networking is, I remember when I joined Bloomberg and probably one or two years into my time at Bloomberg, I was reading a, a report on, on, on the labor market in the UK and London, in London in particular, sorry. And he said that uh, around 30% or even a higher number, I think it was 30%, I don't remember very well, but it was quite a high number. Around 30% of people changing jobs, they were changing jobs to their network. So uh, person X goes to place A, sorry, goes to place B from place A because in place B, person Y knows person X, right? Through networking. Now, it's a little bit of the, the chicken and the egg dilemma, right? If you don't start working, how are you going to network? Well, that was, I think, my dilemma back in those days, right? Because I was thinking, all right, so when will I be able to be part of this 30%? I've only been working for a year and a half, right? And this is my first job or my first serious job. Um, when is that going to happen? Nowadays, you're going to start a job and you're going to have, I don't know how many connections on LinkedIn. And uh, you're going to be able to follow threads on or... or, or or in social networks that have to do with the job that you want to do or the sector that you're interested in or experiences about this, this and that. And there's gonna be people offering advice and offering help. Uh, so again, it's never too early to network. And secondly, it's, I think it's the first time in history where unless you belong into uh, a very elitist group where everybody helps each other, networking is actually happening even before you, you have a job. So start doing it and start using the tools that you have at your disposal. Just keep an eye on things. Um, it's definitely a lot better now than you used to be, uh, minus pandemic times. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm asking you to, to maybe talk a little bit about the, I mean, you've been here in the United States, you're living now in, in, in Great Britain. I think for a lot of Americans, we tend to look at um, the UK as being very similar to the United States. It seems comfortable, it seems um, not so scary. But I wonder if you could maybe uh, talk to us about things that maybe surprised you, that maybe differences, comparisons between the United States and the UK that, may, that you've noticed um, oh. as, as a yeah. European Spaniard. <laughs> yeah. Um... Uh, there are a few, and uh, in all honesty, they're more anecdotal than anything else. Obviously, the language will help, um, but um, yeah, there's, there's, there's. Uh, I guess you could also expand on the ways you see them being similar. Um, yeah, well. no, no, I, yeah, I want to, I want to get to that. So there's, there's, there's certain approach to, to, to. Um, to work. And uh, when I say work, I mean like uh, from the point of view of working. So um, I'm not talking about you setting up your own business and stuff like that. I don't have knowledge about that part of, of, of the market, right? But when it comes to big companies, definitely, definitely, definitely the similarities between what's going on in a large UK company, whether it's a UK company in itself or it's it's got a large, large presence in the UK and those in the US are extremely similar. Um, differences are that I, I wish uh, British people were a little bit more 
to the point and cut to the chase like Americans do. And uh, there's 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 uh, there's a leaning towards having a lot of meetings <laughs> and I t way too many. Uh, but uh, I think that, that that comes from 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 some other elements of of, of the society that is uh, stereotypical British. But when it comes to the to the to the business eth ethics, for example, in a in a large company, a large corporation, you're not going to notice too many difficulties at all. Um, if if anything, uh, um, in in a place like in a place like London, you're going to be more subject, in fact, to what things are supposed to be in a cosmopolitan world, right? So it's chances are you're going to walk into, and I know this is going to sound uh, you're going to wonder why, why is he saying that, but like. Uh, for, uh, you, you walk you walk into you walk into 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 a big company and the amount of different people from different places and that requires an adaptation to that and learning that there are certain limits that you cannot cross and certain behaviors that are not acceptable right um, that's 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 the social aspect of it the work aspect and that's because it's London and it's a cosmopolitan place um, the work aspects in themselves they're not they're gonna they're gonna resemble extremely familiar no, I have no doubt. No doubt, no doubt. I, I saw it. Sorry, Shannon. I saw it. In fact, when I when I went to university in the UK, uh, when I was still doing my bachelor's in Spain, and then when I went back for my postgrade at at USU, right, and I saw way too many similarities. Not just in the way the classes and the lectures were organized and the relationship with the professors, but even the method methodology to, to, to explain and teach things. So those similarities are parallel to the, to, to the similarities in the business world as well. Great, thank you. I, I wanna to touch a little bit about your political science background here. Um, so, and particularly uh, it's a applicability to understanding you know what's been going on in the UK with Brexit and how you maybe yeah. see that uh, impacting the tech sector you in see that impacting uh, British politics and society but I wondered if you could you know, talk to us a little bit about that yes so um, it's um, it's a funny little thing because from the point of view of Brexit, whether you are on one end or the other end of the ideological spectrum, and I really do not like to use the ideological spectrum as a measurement, because it's, it's very constraining, but just to put it in very simple terms, whether you're in one place or another, you know that Brexit hurts business. Simple. Uh, I, never did, I, I never argue against data, I'm not gonna start doing it right now, but the, the, the shrink in the GDP and many other things is, is quite obvious. Why am I saying this? Because well, I, I, yeah. I just sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to for those of you who may not know what Brexit is, okay. it's just really uh, Britain's decision to leave the European Union. I just want to throw yes. that out. So. Correct, correct, and that has trade and economic consequences, which are very obvious and they're available in the press and all that. So I'm not going to bore you with that. But all of the typical indicators of 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 uh, trade directionality as well as GDP, etc. Uh, supply chain problems, etc. They're all there, and it's data. And you know, we we don't discuss data. Data numbers are numbers. Uh, so my point with this is that it clearly hurts business, right? However, it's, it was quite surprising to me during the Brexit campaign, which was four years ago. Sorry, it'll be five years in June. Um, well, that was the, the referendum in June. So the campaign was just a few weeks before that for, for a few weeks, like any other electoral campaign. Um, anyway, so I was quite surprised how little the business world in the UK was pressing against Brexit and uh, was pushing in favor of Remain, which was the option to remain in the European Union. Quite a few uh, financial industries, and sorry about this long background, but I think it's important. Um, quite a few companies or large financial institutions, banks mainly, they were concerned because they, uh, all of a sudden, their operations in the European Union could not be conducted from the UK because the UK was not part of the European Union. Still, there was not a lot of pressure and intervention in terms of lobbying by this business sector to, 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 to remain in the European Union. 
So Brexit happened in the end and it officially happened at the beginning of this year. And uh, what did banks do? Well, they're not that concerned. They still have some operations in the UK, large operations in the UK uh, for global and UK uh, businesses. And they move people to uh, uh, France, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, to continental Europe. With technology, with technology is different though, because um, when you're building something and most of the most everything that is built today it resides in the cloud, whether that's Microsoft, Google, Amazon Web Services, etc. Does it really matter where you build it from? So the main main challenge for the uh, technology sector is twofold. So the first one, obviously, you have to travel through an economic slump due to Brexit and now the pandemic. That, that's 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 a, that's a screw up, and that but that that is screw us all everywhere, right? Whatever you are, because those are two, uh, not Brexit, but the pandemic is is a global crisis. The other main thing is immigration. As I said at the beginning, why these kind of why do these does this kind of technology uh, sector? Uh, move to London because they want to attract talent. They want to attract talent, and they want to sell, and they want to attract them with not just uh, compensation and benefits, but with a lifestyle. Uh, now it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Well, what's going to be the case now for the UK? Well, for Americans, it's not going to change because, well, uh, <laughs> um, whatever bilateral relations there are between the US and the UK for visas and whatever and whatnot, that remains the same. For Europeans. Like my case, for example, I had the opportunity to uh, apply for what they call indefinite leave to remain, which means that I can live here like I used to as a European Union citizen. Nothing's changed for me. The only difference now is that if a crazy parliament one day decides to revoke that, then I'm gone. Uh, I don't have the protection of the European Union anymore. Uh, but it would seem quite stupid to do that, but we live in a stupid time, so you never know. Uh, but that's the main challenge. The main challenge is uh, attracting talent through, uh, and uh, the main challenge is the immigration, the new immigration law. The UK says that they want to uh, stipulate some sort of point system, like the one in Australia, which effectively doesn't work and is not efficient. So we'll see what they're going to do. It's still, um, we're in undefined times. But for American citizens, I don't think anything has changed. Uh, you guys don't have that impact. And I can tell you that all of these technology companies are still here. Thank you. Um, touching upon immigration, and before we started actually a webinar, we were talking about the tech sector's need for diversity. Um, so how, if there are limits on in obstacles now towards immigration, how is the tech sector trying to attract diverse talents and, you know, how is that might be an opportunity well, for some students here? I'm not very sure how they were trying to do that before the pandemic, right? But because what matters is what, what's happening now and what's happening now has been happening for 12 months. That's, there's been a change and uh, the working from home thing works for many people. So if things do not get I don't know, better, or maybe if things are not, if a proper immigration policy that helps um, attract talent in the same way that talent used to come to London when London was part of the European Union, if a proper immigration policy is not developed, I think that at least companies now have learned the working from home works. And let's be honest, technology companies, they were trying to be disruptive with this lifestyle offering. These are what some people call emotional salaries. So they pay you money, but they pay you in certain interesting, you know, elements or benefits uh, that come along with work. One thing that I always dislike is to work five days a week in an office. <laughs> and it's such a cheap thing for a company to give you the opportunity to work from home or to work remotely. Um, it, it, it's, it's the best way as well when you want to coordinate with holidays or visiting family and etc. And uh, I think that that's it was already part of the technology sector, this kind of culture of not having to work in the office five days a week, but now it's become even more, it's, it's become more accentuated, right? So I think that that's going to be one of the ways, connectivity and the ability to, to coordinate teams that are not sitting together. Now, I know that that defeats the purpose of going overseas and get a job, because if you can work from home, it's still necessary. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't played the numbers, as I said earlier, and still. And 
a job is not for life anymore, and I don't think it should be. And um, as 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 you do, as your experience develops, and as your knowledge increases, and as your perspective changes, you may not be happy where you are, and you want to, you know, test the water somewhere else, and you're going to have now the skills to do it and to move to another position, another company, etc. And you need to be there. You need to be where the numbers are. Great, thank you. We have a question from a student, uh, Emma Thornton. She says, hello, I'm an English major and I have a quick question. What if I am not looking for a long-term career in tech, but planning to go to medical school after a gap year? Do you think it would still be a good experience or possible to work entry level in an area such as tech in another country for that short of time? No doubt, no doubt. Because um, unless it's in a, any different, uh, my, my, my sister is a doctor. My sister is a gynecologist. And, uh, and she's been a gynecologist for the last 16 years. So she's got a little bit of experience. And if, and funny enough, quite a few of my good friends are also doctors. It looks like I'm the only one who is not a doctor. And um, you have to deal with patients. And I'm not gonna make a cheap equivalence between patients and clients, because it's not the same thing, not from a moral point of view and not from a relations, re relational point of view, right? But it's still uh, an interaction that it is as extremely important for a doctor as it is for uh, anyone working in, 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 in technology and their clients, right? And learning to develop those skills of listening to people, understanding their problems, uh, understanding the nuances because it's not the same a client in Norway versus a client in Italy. Um, also, you're going to need to manage teams. There's nothing, there's, there's no better school than managing a sales team or a team of program uh, of project managers or a team of account managers. It's, uh, those are transferable skills 100%. And again, uh, this is like, who, you might like more than one thing. Nothing, no one says that, that it's going to make you change your mind and, and that you're not going to be uh, you're not going to go to medical school anymore, but you might be surprised at what you discover and that there's something interesting there. And perhaps it adds uh, an extra layer of perspective to what to do with your medical career. Thank you. We have another question from Noah Turner. He is asking, so how possible common is it for companies to sponsor visas of international workers in the UK? This is especially ah, important because of Brexit. Good question. Um, so my first question to you, and sorry, I'm, I'm answering this way, is so what, what one of my main challenges when I originally tried to move to the US to work after I finished school there, I my, my visa expired. And, uh, and uh, when I tried to go back there, it was again, a chicken and egg dilemma. And uh, it was you either have a visa or you can't apply for anything here, but I couldn't get a visa if I didn't get a job first, whatever. Um, so my first question is, is that the case in the in the UK? So my first question is, are you not allowed to come under uh, no visa or tourist visa or whatever and uh, test the waters and then get a job and get, a, and get the sponsorship that is necessary? Now, to go deeper into your question, uh this sounds it is it, it's, it's a typical it's a typical thing that uh it's a typical thing that um that sounds very challenging and a big obstacle when it comes to recruiting processes right and i always give the advice of playing it as smart if you are here in london and again people are going to hire you by attitude and they're going to train you for a skill and at the same time they're going to do whatever they have to do to retain you so in the end, it's not a problem in itself. For me, the problem is if you cannot be in the country at all, at all, at all, if you don't have a job at all, if you're only just looking for a job, if that's not the case, and I'm not sure if that's the case or not in the UK, if that's not the case, then I don't see any problem at all. Am I making sense? Well, we'll let Noah respond if he has a, to follow up on that. Um, maybe, maybe in that website, uh, uh, they talked about uh, uh, um, visas and permissions. Um, I yeah. I never had to encounter I never encountered that issue. That's why 
I'm just kind of like assuming. So, you know, getting to advice for these students <clears throat> who are potentially, you know, potentially interested in working abroad, potentially interested in working in tech, um, what could they be doing now uh, to help prepare them for, for this? Well, um, so for example, so the first thing is, it's definitely networking. The second thing is trying to figure out, and they don't have to be 100% specific, uh, uh, um, trying to figure out a range of options that uh, they might be interested in and doing your research. When you show, one thing is gonna happen when you interview with people is that they're gonna know if, if you're faking or not. <laughs> Uh, uh, I was going to say, unfortunately, luckily, not many people are good at lying. Uh, so it's it's something that that people are going to catch. Well, why am I saying this? Because if you do research and you demonstrate the interest and and and, and certain excitement for that company, it's going to be a lot easier. Because in the end, believe me, people are going to hire for attitude. People are going to hire somebody they can work with, and that's the thing that they're looking for the most. Um, so if you look like you're going to be good team player, you know, you're going to be part of the group, etc. That's a big advantage. And that's something that you can start doing now. Then if you're really into it, it depends. Like for example, there are so many easy, easy programming languages that anyone can learn by themselves. Now I'm not saying this, so you know how to program because that's for computer scientists. But all of a sudden you show up somewhere and because you're going to be, you're going to be talking to clients or you're going to be talking to your companies, partners outside uh, the actual company, but internally, you're gonna be talking to a lot of uh, technologically minded people. And the fact that you know that language, the fact that you know those concepts, and they're very simple. Uh, I learned them myself and I learned them on, on the spot, not, not particularly reading anything. But if you know that in advance, that's another advantage, right? Um, it depends as well. If you start narrowing down your options, it depends on what you wanna do. People like us are extremely necessary to make companies scale, because if, if, if I have this amazing product and I speak some sort of like garble language from Venus, nothing is gonna happen. A uh, subpar product is gonna come and it's gonna take my place because they can't sell the message and they can't deliver the message. So that's what happens when, when, a, when one of these small companies starts to accelerate. You need people with the ability to sell the message and deliver the message. So. If you're interested in that, then you can look at what sort of teams you want to be part of. And you don't have to be a salesperson. By the way, a salesperson, <laughs> even to myself back in the day, sounded like um, like a car dealership, and I don't want to offend anybody, by the way. But in the sense of traditional, traditional abrasive sales, it's not that. Sales is a strategizing. Sales is making decisions based on that uh, data on where you're supposed to sell or where you're going to be more efficient at selling. Sales is to make sure that you deliver what your client wants internally and you help prioritize and you justify that. And at the same time, the way that you pass on the message internally it, to the clients. But it's not only just sales. There's account management to make sure that your clients are happy, satisfied, and they renew contracts. And it implies the same um, strategic minds and the same abilities to deploy and there's project management and for project management there are some courses out there that that, that teach you how to organize and coordinate multiple decision making uh, uh, centers in competing organizations also organizations with complementary goals but they're not the same goals a client and a service provider for example right and um, how to be a project manager is extremely necessary um, let me give you a super easy example. The vaccination rollouts everywhere are being a mess and they are a, a bookcase example of a project not well managed. And I know it's a massive, the dimensions are massive, right? That's why I'm using it as, a, as an example and it's a little bit of an exaggeration. But project management is that important. So all of these different things as you narrow down more or less what your objectives are, there are courses out there that you can take and there are things out there that you can learn, you can learn now and you can demonstrate that attitude, you can demonstrate the fact that you are invested, you can demonstrate the fact that, you know, you pull yourself up and that you're there to, to, to contribute to the company or the sector or whatever you're applying to. I think that's really an important point, the fact that, you know, most jobs are going to require you to 
to learn something new. There's always going to be Ooh. some element of learning. And if you're not learning, it's not probably a job that's worthwhile for you. Um, I know I had to do the same thing when I took a job in Samsung in South Korea. I had to teach myself this whole new uh, set of both verbiage and set yeah. you know, concepts that were unfamiliar to me. Um, but that's going to happen everywhere. Um, I By guess. Way, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. These kind of these kind of skills, they are in high demand. They are in high demand, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, because they're not easy to find. You can walk around with something hanging over your head that says, I'm a computer scientist. You're a computer scientist, you're a computer scientist. Perfect. How do you find a great uh, project manager, salesperson, account manager, marketing, both from traditional channels, social media, or human resources to scale up the company, etc. How do you know that? How do you know that? You don't know it. You don't know because until you do it, they won't have proof. That's why people hire for attitudes and for those that they think they're gonna work well together, right? And the skills, the skills are on the job site training. And I might've been a great salesperson in a different organization and now I suck, for example, right? Because it's different environment, it's different opportunities and you never know, right? So it's not that easy to recognize and it's extremely necessary to scale up. It's extremely necessary to make a company successful. It's extremely necessary to make the product um, uh, fulfill, I'm gonna sound extremely pompous, to fulfill its tense destiny, right? Um, and, and that's people like us, and that's people like us. Thank you, I think that's a very important point. Um, Brogan, I'm gonna ask you something. Um, talk to us a little bit, this is more maybe a fun idea, but what have you found most rewarding about living in London and, and working in the tech sector? So, so one thing wouldn't be possible without the other. So I wouldn't be working in the tech sector if I, if I went in London. I wouldn't, be, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to afford living in London if I were working in this sector. Um, what is rewarding? Listen, I've got, uh, I've got. Uh, I'm going to start with 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 the uh, most obvious and topical, right? I've got great friends that I made there, got a great network of people, which is good both from a social point of view as well as from a uh, work related uh, point of view. It gives you a certain satisfaction when you manage to deliver something complex, more than what sort of whatever kind of rewards that the company has. Uh, it, it gives you satisfaction. It's also very nice when 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 you feel the warmth of, of a company that looks after you. Uh, I could say that about my current company. I couldn't say it about all the examples in the past as, as, as we discussed earlier, where I've ended up in more difficult environments. But it is nice when you feel that a company appreciates what you do, because in the end, we spend a long bloody time every day working for somebody else, right? So that's quite important, but it also, and, and, and this is just, and those are very topical, but from my own personal point of view, the fact that allows me to understand uh, certain things that I realize that other people who are not in my situation do not understand, that, I, I, I love that. And um, sometimes it helps me be a little bit smart and I love that as well. But let me give you an example, right? So when the 2008 financial crisis hit, how many people could talk about all of these mortgage uh, products, all of these fin uh, structured finance and how that uh, created a credit bubble and the credit bubble bursted and it all comes down from people with very few, with very little income or no jobs or no assets of no sorts that were being financed by banks. I understood that and I knew for a fact that if I hadn't been working uh, uh, for Bloomer at that time, I would have no idea. No idea. Now, nowadays, what's, what are the sexy words nowadays? Artificial intelligence, machine learning. Everybody's gonna slap those everywhere. It's all over my LinkedIn. It's an absolute nightmare. Who can explain what they are for? Why they're used? What the main traits and characteristics are? I can do it. Not to the level of, of, of a developer or a programmer, obviously, but I can do it. And to me, learning all those things is, is, is extremely important. I used to joke with a friend of mine a long time ago, uh, he's from Spain as well, that we, we know that we could speak proper English the moment that we could understand the Financial Times, the newspaper. 
So the fact that uh, I can understand complex issues that happen nowadays at a global level or that have global importance, to me, is, is extremely rewarding. Thank you. I think that's that is very rewarding. Um, and we are living in a very complex world. So the ability yeah. to draw your diverse fields of knowledge together to, to solve problems and to understand that complexity is increasingly important. We only have a few minutes left. Um, I was going to see Andrea, did you have any uh, last minute questions that you wanted to ask or any of the participants? This is your chance to, to ask last, any last minute questions. Yeah, I have to say that you two have both been um, amazingly intuitive because I've been writing down questions as we've gone and I think you guys have answered all of them or asked all of them um, as we've gone. The one that I might I might just ask out of a, a, a curiosity nature, Brogan, is you, know, you yep. touched on how Brexit um, and COVID have impacted the industry, of course. Um, you know, but personally, uh, how are you doing, uh, you know, in lockdown again and things are easing, but how has that situation been for you? And has it been, you know, a challenge? You're, you're in a place that is so cosmopolitan and gives you access to so many great things. Um, you're also in a place that's relatively close if you want to fly home and visit your family, but those things have been really restricted over yeah. the last year. So how have you been dealing yeah. with those challenges? Well, well, um, uh, luckily, I've got I've got good company, and uh, I'm not spending it alone. So uh, I don't think uh, uh, I would be in a good place if I were by myself. I can definitely admit that 100%. So if that were the case, I think I would have gone home to Spain to spend it there. Because luckily, I'm extremely fortunate. I having I, I've had a job all all along. When I changed my when I changed jobs in November last year, it was from one to the next. So I would have been very lucky in that sense. So, but um, if I didn't have company, I would I would be looking for it because I wouldn't be able to, to do this by myself. So that's first of all. So with, with, with the good luck of having company and all that. So from a professional perspective, it is really an experience uh, uh, to, to, to be onboarded into a new job uh, completely offline, not offline. Oh my god! Uh, uh, completely remotely. <laughs> um, now I can say in the future that I've done that. It still sucks, <laughs> you know. Um, so from a from a professional perspective, I really enjoy to be able to go to my office uh, and uh, not just get to know the people that I've been talking to over in this case Microsoft Teams. The company the competition, uh, but um, it's just silly that every time that I have a question, I have to set up a call in my calendar. It's just ridiculous, so and a waste of time. So that's from a professional perspective. At the same time, as I said earlier, my company is very, it, the company is very nice. My company is very nice to 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 employees, and um, and uh, we just missed out on a corporate. Uh, celebration in Tel Aviv, which is where my company is based in Israel. By the way, Tel Aviv, another massive technological hub, massive technological hub. Um, so um, we missed on a few good social things. Then from a personal point of view, I haven't seen my parents in a long time. Uh, I barely see my friends here in London. But most importantly is, is, is the routine of everything that you do on a daily basis happens between the same, the same walls. And that inability to transition out of something into something different, whether you call that meeting your partner or going for a dinner or going for a couple of beers or something like that, that inability to transition in, sorry, transition out and into something different, that's the hardest part. I think the students and all of us can, can definitely absolutely, relate. absolutely. Oh my God, I'm not, I don't, I'm not portraying myself as uh, uh, no, but I could, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know everybody relates. Everybody relates. Well, Brogan, it looks like we're out of time, but I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. And I, 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 I like to reiterate that my details are available to you two to share if anyone wants to have a call one day or send an email or whatever that may be. Uh, I've, I've met with USU students in the past when they came to London. If anyone is coming, well, yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Brogan. We appreciate your willingness to share your experiences with the students and to be a resource for them if they want to reach out and get in touch with you about your experience. So thank you so very much. And we wish you uh, continued success and we wish you, you um, good health <laughs> in Thanks. the COVID you year. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I'll let our audience know that we are, uh, Shannon and I are still working to finalize the details of our April Around the World Wednesdays event. Right. Um, so stay tuned and do come back and uh, hear more from us. But thank you everyone who joined us today. And uh, we wish everyone a uh, happy and safe afternoon. I'd like to. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. No problem. Thank you. Bye.